Hello and welcome to another video in our maze creation series. In this video we're going to look at how to find a solution path for your maze. If you've not already done so then you might um, prefer to pause this video and go back and watch the previous mazes in this series where we explain um, how to create the maze, how to draw the maze so you can see it, and also how to show the distances between um, different uh, squares in the grid. In this video, we're going to look at how to find a solution for your maze, which is obviously useful if you're going to create a maze for somebody else to solve. So to do that, we're first going to create our maze. So here I'm just creating a 20 by 20 maze, and that's using the algorithm explained in the previous videos. And then I'm going to show the distances between all the different squares in the grid. Again, that's using the algorithm that was explained in the previous um, video in the series, which was entitled How to Calculate uh, Distances in a Maze. Okay, so now that we know the distances between any pair of um, squares in the grid, how do we then find our solution? Well, we need to set our start and our end um, cells. So here I've got the start at the top left and the end at the bottom right, um, but that doesn't need to be the case. You could, of course, set them anywhere. So how are we going to find the path between these two squares? Well, again, it may seem difficult, but as with a lot of things with mazes, the algorithm that we're going to use is actually very simple. So all we do is we start at the target square, which is the one in light blue down here with 182 marked in it. And then we're simply going to ask the question, which neighbor has the lowest value? Well, we can see here we have two neighbors that are connected to it. One contains 183 and one contains 181. Well, clearly the lowest value there is the 181. So then we move to that square and we mark that as the next move in our path. Then we repeat the process from this square. Which of its neighbors that it's connected to has the lower value? Well, we can see 180 there and 182 there. So we go 182, 181, 180. And then from this square, we look at each of its neighbors that it's connected to and we say, which has the lowest value? It's this one with 179, so we move there. And we repeat, and we repeat, and we repeat, and we repeat the process until we get all the way back to the start. So let's see what our solve path looks like. So clicking Show Solution, which implements this very simple algorithm, shows us in yellow the path that we take to go all the way back from our target end square, all the way around, ripping around the grid, all the way around here, and all the way back to our start square. And that's it, we found the solution. It's as simple as that. You just start at your endpoint, find its connected neighbor with the lowest value, move to that, and repeat the process. Find in each neighbor in turn that has the lowest value until you reach your start cell. And that's it, that's your solution marked. Now you might notice various pink squares along the way here. Here we've just marked the decision points in the grid in pink. Um, it's a useful metric when you're creating a maze and you're thinking about difficulty. Because when you're creating a maze to give someone, if you want to have some challenge, then you probably want to have a couple of things. You want to have a solve path that's a decent length. So a solve path that just goes in a straight line is really quite boring. And you also want to have some points along the way where there's some tricky decisions to make. So with this maze, you can see that each of these enclosed areas that's grey is going to be a part of the maze that the solver doesn't need to visit um, to find the solution. So the first decision they're going to make is when they come to this square here, square 15, that's the first one with a pink neighbour, um, but that's a trivial decision. It's only a, a uh, one square dead end effectively um, along the solve path. Um, and here likewise, um, as we come round, we can sort of look at each one and see. So here that's very small as well. Here it's also, the, the, the eye can kind of see within a second that you don't need to go there. So this is going to be quite a simple maze to solve um, because all the decision areas are very small. Um, that one's small, that one's small. The first real decision point of notice here where you have a decision to come up into this larger area here, but intuitively a human solving this maze who wants to get to the bottom right is kind of already going to see by eye. They've, they've filled in this region so this one is isolated um, and then you come round and round and round. Here's another really big decision point here, look this is the whole left hand side 
that's unvisited by the solution path. But again, the solver, when they get to here, is going to discount this straight away and come round. So you can predict that this maze has got a nice long solve path. That's good, but it's not going to be very challenging to solve. And that's often the case when you have mazes used in this particular algorithm, um, that because it creates very long winding paths just by its nature, then you often have relatively few decision points um, compared to other mazes. So it's something to bear in mind. Now, how do you uh, work out where a decision point is in a maze? It's actually really simple. It's just a square that has three uh, connections that's connected to three others. So if we look at this square here containing 181, then you can go left, you can go up, and you can go down. Whereas all the other squares that are just in yellow, you have two connections here. You can go up and down. Um, here you can go up and down. Here you can go left and right. But here you can go up, down, and left. So any square that's connected to three others is going to be where a decision point occurs. Um, and you can go the, the wrong way, as it were. Um, that takes you away from the solution. If you want to create a really long path, then you can obviously use this information to work out where a, a longer solution would be. So having 182 steps is pretty good here, but you can see, for instance, we've got 207 over here, so that's a longer path. So you could make that square um, the solution square if you wanted. Um, so that's square 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, 140, um, 160, 164. So you could set the end square to 164. Um, and then show the path there. And so you can see now we've got a much longer solution path instead of 182 squares. We've now got a solution path of 213 squares. So if you gave this uh, maze to somebody, then they've got a longer uh, distance to travel, um, a longer solve path. So it's a very useful way to uh, use this simple algorithm to work out a, a nice solution path through a maze. Um, if we make a new maze, for instance, and we set the solution to, let's say, the top right corner, um, show the distances there, you can see it's 135 squares away. Um, so that's not actually too bad. Um, but you could imagine with some mazes, your designated um, solution square could be a very short path. And in that instance, um, you know, you'd want to you'd want to change it. So here that's 135, but here we've got 208. Um, so we can set that as the solution and now we've got a much longer solution path and again the nice thing about this visualization is that we can have a very quick intuitive look using the colors to find out where the decision points along the maze are and how likely that decision point is to potentially confuse the solver um, into going down that path and making it tricky to solve so what you really want is larger areas but larger areas where the solver might realistically um, decide to go down uh, <laughs> that alternative route so here we've got a really, really short solution. So we'd we'd obviously want to make that with a, a longer solution path. Um, now on this maze, although it's a relatively short solve path, um, you can see there's quite a few uh, decent decision points along the way. Um, so here you might plausibly trick the solver, as it were, into going down and exploring this region here. That's enclosed, but getting stuck. Um, here there's also a decision point. And here, again, there's a decision point. Though if you've already come down this path here, probably the unsolver is unlikely to, to get tricked by this and come across to the right. Um, but still, you can see how useful the very simple algorithm is to, to visualize a maze and get a sense of how difficult it's going to be to solve. OK, hope you found this video useful. In the next video, we will look at how to create uh, shaped mazes using a mask. And again, be assured it's nice and simple. We hope you found this video useful. If you did, then please do like the video and subscribe to our channel. It only takes a couple of seconds and it really does help to support us. And that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.